I am unashamed. What about you? So how how many through the looking back over the years because we're all getting a little bit longer in the tooth as they say. Speak yeah. for yourself. <laughs> Jay's just experienced a new birthday or a, a latest birthday himself. Uh, how many groups like you know house church Bible talk. Um, small groups. We've had so many different names for them through the years. But how many have you been a part of, you think, over the course of your now almost 50 years, Dad, for how many have you led, been in, been a part of? One of them lasted what what, what we call house churches. Uh, we volunteered our abode for people to come to. So I've already forgotten what day we met. You know, there we've is, probably met every day of the week. We met every day of the week <laughs> at different people, times. People coming and going, so and, and we would meet in our house. We did that for about twenty years. Yep. Now Miss Kay has various uh, women groups she works with, so she works with the basically the women. They get together and, and they'll have a little meal and they'll have their Bible lessons. And sometimes it's ten or fifteen, sometimes twenty, thirty. But she does that during the week, you know. I mainly deal with men and women, but if I if I we deal with women, we have sisters or wives on the premises. Right. Just to be there. Well, probably from the beginning before Jason and I went to school or whatever, when we were we have a part of a little church out here, it was kind of a little community church. Y'all were kind of raised in an atmosphere of of a house church well there was always was your, there was always people there and yep. we were certainly always studying some a lot some, of hospitality you and mom would have people in that taught you yeah because you were new christians so like i remember those where yep. you'd feed the preachers fish and then they you'd, then there'd be a big bible study after it and then there were times when there would be people come in and you would teach them because yep. they didn't know the gospel so that was kind of our upbringing out I, here on the river but I, but I remember when y'all came to that conclusion because you're in the middle of nowhere, it'd be hard for, to get people to show up out here. Well, you think that, but they've, but, they've been coming for 40 years. Phil it, used to say, the reason I'm sharing Jesus with everybody that comes down here, because I'm assuming they're lost. <laughs> Literally. In, in more ways and than one. I yes. mean, what are you doing down here? So <laughs> the Lord must have sent them. But I just remember. Plus, then a TV that, show came out of that, and that your the audience swelled exponentially to when it got from, a little beyond it went from a few rednecks meeting around to you know like about a 12 million audience <laughs> yeah. that god dropped on us so that, then it went to of, we need a gate <laughs> yeah <I> said, <laughs> we, we had then this. it became like we looking out in your at eight o'clock and seven thirty in the morning you look outside and in your driveway <laughs> there's 50 vehicles well that that yeah. certainly was a different era i said we're gonna have to <laughs> We're going to have a but I just remember when I was, I guess, a teenager or whatever, and and you were going to, you, you would say, let's do a fish fry and we'll do a house church. It wasn't necessarily week in and week out. It was just like, let's let's do this. Or like once a month, there was a process there. Yeah. And I remember several times more people would show up than we would anticipate and Phil would be like, go, go run another net. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would just remember that. Yeah. It was that true. moment. Well, of, well, we had um, some, we had some lows and fishes moments, but unlike Jesus, we couldn't just miraculously make it happen. So somebody had to go get some more fish and come back. Right. That was yeah. Our, but the, the same fish concept. that were actually in the nets, probably we can look at it a lot of different ways, but somehow <laughs> Usually there was fish in always, the nets. We always had enough. Yeah, that's exactly. Well, it was more painful though because you knew that was money that you weren't going to make. That's right. That's correct. When, when you had to run them, well, we usually ran. We those noticed nets. that when you can eat all the fish, you can hold free. That people come to that. Yeah, yeah in mean, mass. <laughs> well, it is. It is ironic, and we've talked about this card. before. That that's a very biblical. I mean, Jesus did the same thing. He sure did, and on a couple of yeah. different occasions. So, and then he had, had fish himself. You know, it is it is after his. They had the throw nets, you know, and they kind of just go down and scoop up, scoop them up. 
but we had primarily hoop nets, sometimes webbing. So we had trammel, what they call trammel nets. I'd love to see a Galilee because it, it, when I looked at it, of course, a hoop net wouldn't work unless you had a bridle. We had much of, better netting than they had 2,000 years ago. Well, there was no current, but you drop a trammel net across that thing. Of course, you'd need one about a few thousand yards <laughs> long to yeah. go across it. But, boy, I would... I would love to do that just once. I'm yeah. sure it's probably illegal in some oh, Did you I'm see sure. anybody actually fishing it? No one. Huh. But I asked, I've told this story before, when we ate the restaurant, there were kids throwing food over the over the dock, and I saw all these Opelousas cat gather up by the hundreds. That That's what was eating. They were throwing popcorn. When you and, saw this with your yeah. eyes. Yeah. Opelousas. All ops, all flatheads. They look. Then everything they, started coming together for you. I said, "Yep, I see why we we you know Jesus chose here." <laughs> <laughs> he knew. I mean, I really thought that. A lot of our but, listeners that they're thinking, "Uncle Lucy's cat." I wonder what he looks like. They they wouldn't believe it if you told them. You know what I admire about Uncle Lucy's cat? We've talked about them before. That each one, like a like a blue cat per se, look, they all look identical, yeah. just bigger, smaller. But an Opelousas cat, they all have a slightly different pattern yeah. to them. They're all unique. Which is, I said this before, because somebody tried to correct me that about being an Appaloosa, it, which is another term for them, like an Appaloosa horse, because mm-hmm. it's the same concept, but same you know generic color. But yeah, they all have a different pattern. There's some of them are darker, some of them are lighter, yep. some of them are super. You know, it's real light color ones oh, yeah. versus the dark colors. So you just never know. So what part of seawater? Figured what that? department how come, in seawater? How came come out? most catfish <laughs> all have the same exact general makeup, and then you have the Opelousas catfish, which is the best eating by far, which is has no nothing that there's not two alike. That's right. I mean, I think that's. Worthy of something note. to say. Hmm. So, yeah. so the, the groups we had, there was always a purpose. We went, so we left this little smaller group we had out here. We went back to a larger church, but we took the group mentality with us. And I remember when we went back, there was a preacher there named Ray Melton who was who was a good friend of ours. And so they were kind of just starting the idea that if we're going to have a large church, if we're really going to get into people's lives, we're going to have to break this thing down where you're actually interacting with each other, not just coming up and sitting on Sunday morning, listening to a preacher, which, you know, so, and it was a good concept. So we were kind of, the, <laughs> yeah, thank you know, we were still the, the same problem today. <laughs> exactly. So we were the Guinea pigs sort of to start that group stuff up. And, and I remember the first thing I ever did before I ever worked for the church or anything, I led a group and it was called uh, Stevenson came up with this uh, Dan's dad. It was called a micro group is what yep. they call this one. And it was just three guys and me. And I'm fairly new Christian, so I mean, I know just a little bit more than these three guys knew. So it wasn't like I was, you know, real heady. But but it was just going through basic, simple things about the gospel. And, you know, I still remember all three of This is 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago. I still remember all three of those guys. One of them, two of them, two out of the three are still with us at, at WFR. And one of them wound up going to prison right after that because he had some issues. But but he made it through that and he's he's a strong brother but i still remember that initial group that i led 30 plus years ago it shows you the power of community yeah that you don't forget that you know i think that was god's i mean we're bringing this up because romans 16 and, and just the entire new testament there's way more about house churches than synagogue worship right that's correct people were meeting in homes from various different types of leaders and i think you're right. It works better when you have the big pod. Everybody gets together on Sunday morning. Kind of a pep rally. Then the next phase are the house churches, which we've been a part of a house church for, you know, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Over various, 30, yeah. Yeah, various different then you have various, Offering your body as a living sacrifice in view of God's mercy, what he did through Jesus, the gospel, good news, Make it your ambition to live a quiet life. So, you know, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You say, holy and pleasing to God. Don't conform it along to the pattern of this world. Well, this is a 
a far stretch from what the world does. We were down there praying, singing, sharing the scriptures. Mm-hmm. But what Teach, I was showing love, joy, peace. what I'm saying yeah. is then you had the model, then the house church went to various small groups and then even to the micro groups. I think the micro group idea came for new Christians. That's what it was. So you'd have someone who was because I used to lead like five of them back back yeah. in the day. Yeah. I do that five nights a week. I have five different pods of young guys. Because another thing, too. Because what you're doing is you're discipling them. I mean, you are. You're leading them in the things they need to know because they're brand new. And, and so you're spending time with them, just like Jesus did well, with his disciples. I think what, what we erroneously did with all the groups that have manifested themselves within Christianity, all the groups, it got to be, what do you call it, Al? Kind of like the Pharisees had done to the law. They just formed kind of a uh, a group meeting and kind of like an event on Sunday mornings where you just go and you don't participate much. Well, I think it's, I think sit. a better analogy is they were trying to reproduce temple, the temple experience. Yeah, because you know that's why he said you said Romans twelve we are that temple now, but they had a mindset that you go to the temple. And you don't really encounter God. He's there. His presence is there in the most holy place that you can't get to. Yep. And then you offer up a sacrifice, and then you go back home, and you live however you live. And so I think that's that's a there's been a try an attempt to reproduce. Well, the, the, and they'll the, even call a place a sanctuary. The you know? cheesy churchy slogan is, "We should be pursuing relationships instead of rituals," but I think that is it. Yeah. It's ritualistic worship versus having relationships, which is what small groups are all about. That's true. Because you got to remember, these people who came to Jesus, especially all my buddies back in the day when I was in my early 20s, they came to Jesus. Of course, now we all, we've all we gone through this many times. They're going from the literal water and spirit field to the wilderness because they don't have anything to do. Right. They've been in mischief every night for the past couple of years, getting drunk, going bar hopping. And all of a sudden they come to Jesus. So, and they're excited about that, but what are they going to do? So we basically had a group, a lot of those guys back in the day. And even to this day, other people just stepped in to this day and they're doing the same thing. They have a somewhere every night that you can go. Yeah. Just think about it. There's a group somewhere at our the two churches that I'm involved in, there's a group every night somewhere. Right. Yep. So when somebody tells me, well, you know, why I need something, I was like, Here, I'm going to give you two churches because somebody is meeting right now. That's right. Which I think is awesome. And a lot of people that come out of the, you know, especially coming out of the world, they need to be occupied with spiritual things because the evil one is still after them. And so they have to, you know, they need to be with some people. Until it becomes a pattern. Right. You know, that's you know, right. Until it becomes Romans twelve again. You know, well, you know, it's don't, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Right. Well, most people in the world are not sitting around talking about Jesus. No. Well, but plus you you, you got to remember or the, how to behave the phrase himself. God defined it at is being born again. Well, you wouldn't take a a newborn baby and just say, "All right, good luck." Um, it, it it doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way in a spiritual context right. either. You just don't pat them on the back and say, yeah, good luck. Let's, uh, yeah. let's take a break. And one of the things I want to mention, because I, I, I get a few emails that say, I know you guys are down on big churches, but the, but you're, you're misunderstanding what we're talking about. We're not down on big churches. In fact, all three of us. I love through the churches. Me too, because they invite us to come in to some big place to get more people to come in and hear the gospel. So I'm all about big. That's good. Well, big you, means there's a lot of people going to heaven there. That's right. And look, that's there's a, there's a lot of groups out there that I mean they got it going on. They got excitement. They they love. Jesus. I'm down on legalistic churches. Well, and not leaving behind that it's not just about the big. It has to go to the individual and the small. That's the whole point of this. But you, that's you what's happening. Right. Yeah. So so I mean you're trickling down. I'm down on ritualistic churches, whether they're big or small. Right. It, it has to. You at some point though, it, to get big, there has to be groups of people 
on a daily or nightly basis in homes or in at their workplace or in some way get, getting together and connecting in Jesus and those little teams, which is not unlike what Jesus did. He come down here and he picked 12 people and they took off. And then they went from town to town. I mean, they kind of went the opposite, started small, went big. But I'm saying a lot of these churches who are big and may have got lazy need to get small again, not everybody move away, but in their own individual groups. That's why we're we're a big proponent for small groups in well, some capacity. And think about it. You go back to the Old Testament model again. How many times is it said in the prophets and in Psalms, I don't want your tithes. I don't want your sacrifices. I want your hearts turned so to I me. Kill so you, <laughs> Get him, Jace. <laughs> That's a recluse, huh? Tarantula. Yeah. <laughs> well, the forces I mean, I of evil, the forces of evil it. have risen up against us. <laughs> Once again, on the Unashamed Podcast, you never know what you're going to have to take a pause for. And we're not cutting that out because that's just part of what we do. <laughs> yeah. A big spider crawls up. you well, got to take care I of it. I love That was a big one. I'm glad you had a <laughs> shoe you could get off in a hurry. I love there. spiders. Did that thing come off of you and just come out of a crack in the wall? I saw it come out, and it come, but it saw me and it raised up. I said, that's where you messed up. I'm not going to be intimidated by it. I mean, that spider there will hurt you. <laughs> the so, forces of evil come at you in various ways. So what I'm doing is, is God has put us in charge of the animal kingdom. This spider here should have stayed outside. Yeah, He's then got in here where we live and function. And... Uh, Okay. Uh, good job. Sorry Bryce. about that. It's all right. It's so in a lot of ways, to prove your point, I mean, when you get right down to it, Al, what we're doing right now is a small group. It is. And There's we, three of us. We do this. We do this about uh, four times a week and yep. just to be able to share with other people. Here was the problem. So so the historical side of it, and, and we're going to dive in a little bit into Romans 16, you had the church by nature had to start like it did. It was it was a lot of people. You know, there was 5,000, 3,000 being added, a lot of people. But they had to meet sort of underground once the persecution started. Think about it, Al. It's 2,000 years from the time this was written. But say take uh, North Korea, uh, China, uh, where else? Uh, Iran. Iran. Yep. You, there are small groups of Christians. Mm-hmm. That's the and and look, it's a mighty throng. Of in them. China, there's millions, yeah. but they're they're under the radar out right. to this day because so they have to be. So they're uh, moving around and they're going to this house and that house and over there. But and the Chinese, they 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 got it fixed where they're very hard to locate. So by nature, the very things we're talking about with community being in people's lives are going to happen naturally. You get around 300 A.D. and Constantine was the emperor of Rome. And he converted to Christianity. Yep. And all of a sudden, we went from an underground thing to a national thing where it was okay. Everybody could come out of the closet and be a Christian. The problem was the first thing he did, because he loved God and his you know, faith, is he started building these big structures. Because now it's like anybody can meet anywhere, you know. So at, at first, it probably seemed awesome, you know, for the mm-hmm. church because we were out there. In fact, he, he took his whole army and, and, and basically said, if you're going to be a Roman army in the Roman army, you got to be baptized, which is not the best way to lead people to Christ. <laughs> but he just he kind of forced the whole army to be baptized. Yeah. But here's the thing: but what ha- that started a process then that we're still struggling with today, where it became about the structure as opposed to the people, and so that's a big change. Three hundred years earlier, when Jesus was on the earth, a big change occurred for that to even happen. Shows you the power of the gospel. You right. see what I'm saying? Right. It's any successful team and unit. I mean, they do it like in football. You see the team, everybody come and play them, but they all have individual talents and individual. Like when they're practicing and the wide receivers all together, they're in this little group. They the all tight ends. You, you, the they unite. Backs. Yeah, they unite, and everybody works on their own stuff, and then they're trying to bring everybody together. And well, the ones that pull that off. 
they, they're successful. They yeah. win. Yeah. And they win. And, and when yeah. you watch them in warm-ups before the game, that's what they're doing. They're all doing their little drills. Uh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, they, they, they split into the two units, and they're running some plays, and these guys over here are getting the defense ready. Military does the same yeah. thing. They break them down into you know right. small groups all the way up to – Whatever the name. That's a good analogy are, because you know. it's the big game is that we're in front of these, you know, in SEC, we're in front of 100,000 people to perform. But you realize that the only way they're going to perform well is everything else that happened that week and everything before that moment to get them in the position oh, exactly. to perform. Well, well, and I think it illustrates also that we all have different talents and and ways to go about and methods, I guess, of sharing Jesus and getting in people's lives. So each group kind of takes on its own identity right. in in Jesus. And I think there's, I think that has to happen in, in churches. Yeah, it has to. Yeah, it's the yeah. same mentality that for success, for overall success, you have to have at the individual level people doing exactly what they've been called to do, which is pretty yep, good. Exactly. So in uh, so Romans 16, just to go ahead and get there, so Paul is closing out the book, and we already kind of said at the end of chapter 15, he sort of had this personal like appeal to them on what he'd been doing and what he's about to be doing. And I think it was, it was sort of twofold because he was going to Jerusalem to drop off a you know a contribution that he had taken from all the Gentile churches to give one last time because the, the Jerusalem church was very poor because they were under this Roman tyranny in Jerusalem. So the, they had it rough. You know, we know that from the first few chapters in Acts. So he's going to give them some money and because he said it's important that the other churches bless the Jerusalem church because that's where the gospel started. So I, he's kind of his last time to go there. So I think that was special to him. And now he's fixing to head to Rome and meet these guys for the first time. And so that kind of is leading into this chapter 16, uh, which, yeah, is, which, which is, is for the house churches that meet there. Which a lot of people, they wouldn't read Romans 16. I mean, I, I, I dare say there's been very few classes <laughs> in churches on Romans 16. Or podcasts. Very few. <laughs> Because they're like, oh, he just sends some finally. Yeah, he's just telling everybody, hey, hey. Why would you take the time, knowing this is inspired writing? That's right. To write down the names of various individuals. That means something important. You know what really impacted me? Now, there are two little sermons in there, which is in Romans 16, 17 through 19. Yep. And then 25 through 27. And, And those are awesome for churches because he basically in the 17 through 19 section says, watch out for these people who are among you who are trying to lead you astray. So yeah. that that's always going to happen. And, and a lot of people, they don't like going to churches or being a part of a church because they're like, well, there's people there who are hypocrites or not real. Yep. Paul acknowledges that yep. they're, they're there. What's that got to do with you? Yep. Right. Nothing. So that's an excuse. And then that last statement really just, I think, sums up his the whole letter in, in a paragraph form. I mean, right. it, it's really kind he's, of a deep Yeah, he's going to go, go back and sort of sum the whole thing up. Let's, but, let's take a break, Jace, before we start. But before that, what moved me the first time I read Romans 16 is that we have a model pretty much in America that churches go by. You got the one guy in charge and his, his poor wife, you know, she's the pastor's wife <laughs> and that's what she's known for. And everybody's watching every move she makes just because the and pressure's she, on here. Right, you know, right. you're, yeah. you're, Most of the wives, they just sit there quietly. Yeah. yeah. And this pastor's hoping, ha- not, hoping not to offend is yeah. having to do all the work because that's what paying him do. When Ephesians, Paul also wrote that all these people who are the leaders, they're to prepare God's people for the works of service. Right. Yep. So we, we, but the model, we, we just, that's, that's what it is here. We put it all it, on one man and no one man can really handle that well. No. Well, the model it, it shouldn't. that Paul gives indirectly here is nothing like that. I mean, the first person he mentioned, he says, is our sister, Phoebe. He's servant of the church. 
in however you say that place. You want to try Centria. it? Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. What in the world would she have had to do where she's top on the list of Paul and in this ministry? What, what do you think her life? A very well, serving woman. And a leader. And a, and a leader. leader. And, and, and it's interesting, Jace, because that word, a servant, is in the, the NIV version we're reading. In the more updated version, they use the word deacon. You also see deaconess uh, down in the margin. And then that word later for she's helped a lot of people, the, the word benefactor is uh, is what that means, you know, from the Greek. So I thought it was interesting is that Paul would mention her first. And this also goes back to, you remember one of the criticisms we talked about when we were talking about Jesus was the Pharisees. And they said, look, he even has women so much in his inner circle. Remember when yeah. that was one of the charges against Jesus? So much for women being silent in the churches. <laughs> well, and that, and I think that's why we get off. And look, the last place I was at, uh, somebody asked me about that. You know, I was, was, you know, we was doing a meet and greet. He's like, yeah, I heard, uh, I heard you on the podcast trying to change the role of women. So I looked around behind me. Because he was looking, I was like, oh, you're talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it when I meet somebody and they mischaracterize whatever they thought I said. <laughs> and that's their greeting, you know. It kind of it kind of ticked me off. It's not the best but, way to greet. <laughs> no, it's not at all. I said, well, you have a situation in Corinth. Now, we're in Romans now. And I, I do think it's interesting that Paul picked out a woman right off the bat mm -hmm. and said, hey, she's helped me and everybody else around here. I mean, that that woman, I commend her. And I like the I idea mean, that she's a benefactor as well as a servant. By the way, there were a lot of those. Lydia, who we read about in Acts 16, she was a businesswoman, and it was just her and some women that helped start the whole Philippian church. So, I mean, they played a women played a huge role in the oh, yeah. early well, these, in the early part of the church. But you're right. Jesus' apostles and those women that that followed along, who, by the way, followed all the way to the cross. Yep. Uh, and then the next chapter, when we get to Acts, this is a little obscure verse, but I want to read it because I think it's important. But in Acts one, where he says those who were present upstairs. And you remember, it said, where does it say all the believers? Oh, that's in 15, where he's, yeah, he stood up among the, among the uh, believers. Now, look, it's a big debate about, because 120 just seems so small. You would think there would at least have been 5,000 who ate the fish and the bread <laughs> gathered up there. Yeah. You know, and all the America, there's 120? That's it? But before he says that, they had returned to Jerusalem because you remember he said, "You'll receive power yep. when the Holy Spirit comes." And and we we know this is leading to the Spirit being poured out. So they're gathering up in Jerusalem, <clears throat> and when they arrive, verse thirteen, they went upstairs to the room and where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, and Simon, and and Judas, not the one that betrayed him, the other one. They all joined together constantly in prayer in this next little phrase, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brother. So this was, this was the cadre that had now experienced Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection and appearing. And he was there, but that along with the women in that culture at that time is the same yeah. reference you said when they're like, I mean, he's got women as key people around his chosen people. Right. I mean, he actually has women. Because let's face it, the degrading and of women. And they're allowing them to say things. <laughs> the degrading of women in a lot of cultures is horrible, even to this day. Right. I mean, it's like no sit down, shut it. up, and cover up. We don't want to see anything but your eyeballs coming out. Yeah. And, right. and, and if I you think, don't comply, we're going to. Wrap you on the back. Think about it. They couldn't even <laughs> vote in these United States for, you know, 150 years or whatever. I mean, yeah. that, that's really embarrassing. I mean, <laughs> oh. 
It's, so, it's, I, it's half the <clears throat> workforce of a country, of a church, of a whatever. Yeah. And it's interesting because you're Boy, right. Boy, look at the stunts we pulled just over that. Yeah. But these legal legalistic people today in the church, you know, I think they take took the situation that was going on in Corinth, which, look, you got a culture who's really struggling with gender identity. Yeah. I mean, 1 Corinthians, uh, where's that? Where he goes through the sins they were into. It, First Corinthians that is what some six, of you were. Yeah, First Corinthians 6. Of course, he did say that is what some of you were. But they yeah. were all gender-related. I mean, you had the homosexual oh, had references in there yeah. and the male prostitutes. And you it, couldn't tell the men from the women. <laughs> right. You had the long hair issue come up, which people yep. now in our culture confuse with wearing a hat. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I don't think that was his point there. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think but if is. you're looking, if you look like a woman, if you're a man and you look like a woman and you're a woman and you're looking like a man and you meet, he, he brought that up. Yep. He, he, and where's that? First Corinthians, read it. It's in there. But I think he, it's 11. Yeah. First Corinthians 11. So, and, and, and they also have the ability to do spiritual gifts at the laying homes of, laying of the hands of the apostles. Right. So just think about how that plays. You now have the ability to do miraculous events. So that when they got together in their assembly, there were some women, evidently, in 1 Corinthians 14, who were just trying to use these gifts without being uh, submissive to the overall function of the gathering. Right. They were being disruptive. Right. So he he chastised them, but it was more about the use of spiritual gifts than it was, you know, this role of women. Right. It, and what I gave the analogy today, it's like, you know, my niece got up and spoke at our church, Willie's daughter, and shared what she was doing around the world for Jesus. Well, there were a few people saying, "Hey, you know, women are supposed to sit down and shut up." You know, they, they she shouldn't be speaking. She yeah. was reaching. I said, I asked her dad. I said, "So, how many people is she has she impacted out there?" He said, mm, "Half a million, five hundred thousand." Yeah, I just said, in one she's year. She's spoken to five hundred thousand <laughs> girls, young women mm. like her. Said, "They said that's correct." I'm so, like, so I'm the, like, turn her loose. I don't yeah. want to so, shut her up. So the elders who are. Married to women who are single units before the Lord. I mean, that's what Jesus said. What what God has joined together, let not man separate. They thought it'd be a good idea if she got up. They thought it'd be inspirational for her to share about sharing in Jesus. So there's no authority issue. Right. The, the elders made the decision. This is what we're doing. She's humbly saying, yeah, I'll share. And And what's funny, not funny, Ironic is if she would have done this a hundred yards away, outside in the parking lot, nobody said a word. Well, that's the, and that's you know what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 or down at the Civic Center. Well, let's, well, right. hey, let's take another break. So you can go speak at the Civic Center or out in the parking lot or any other day besides Sunday, yeah. and you're good. Right. But walk in here, turn around at the request of the elders, and somebody says, you know, I don't know if we ought to do this because First Corinthians 14 says she's supposed to sit down and shut up. I'm like, well, maybe you're not viewing First Corinthians 14 in a proper way. You ever thought about that? <laughs> which is which is why we talk about the context of Scripture all the time yeah. and why things were said when they were said. Well, yeah, back, but, to, Romans, well, back me, to Romans 16, why would he start well, right. with a woman? But I want to say this one point. Now, I'm not saying if the same girl who they said, get up and do this, if she was sitting on the back row and you were up there preaching and all of a sudden she just decides, you know what? It's time. The Lord told me. Yeah. And she I'm stands take up over. and starts hollering. Well, guess what? Then I would go to 1 Corinthians 14. I'd say, I think we, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? You yeah. know? You need to go ask your husband about this at home. Don't be just, uh, or go talk to the elders and and let's give you some some time if they deem it necessary. <laughs> but the fact that you're doing this on your own on the back row probably means they're not going to put a thumbs up on you getting up there. Yep. So that's what I'm saying. It's not like we're we're against that, 
but I just think people draw conclusions on what this means as a structure in a ritualistic way. And they get a million miles away from the goal, which is reaching people. Right. The persecution Jesus. against women goes back ages. Yeah. Well, I think for years, personally, I mean, I'm getting on my soapbox here, but by trying to make it ritualistic and, and where I think we had an issue there that needed to be addressed, I think we just addressed it. You know, that, and that's fine. But to make some kind of ritualistic rule, you're basically muzzling half of your ambassadors for Jesus. Yeah. And it's yep. it's been done in a lot of churches and and that's the unfortunate part about it. Yeah. And it and it and it hurts us to try to reach the culture. Well, interestingly, Jace, the next per, the next person, people, he talks about he goes back to our old pals from Acts eighteen. Which is a power couple. Power couple, Priscilla so we got and Aquila. A, we're assuming a single woman. And then he goes to a power couple, Priscilla and Quill. We've talked about them mm -hmm. because they keep coming up in the Bible, which other times, you know, just individuals are brought up that you know that they had they had something going, which I'd like to think that about my wife and I, because we got together in Jesus. I mean, that was really the only thing we have in common and in a lot of ways. She hates it when I say this, but to this day, that's about all we got in common besides our kids. Right. And I so, wonder what he meant when he said they risked their lives for me. I don't know. I that, stood, they, they, that stood out. But to me, when you're risking your life. They kept him from getting killed somehow. Well, when you. This couple. You remember back when they you first read about him, that's when they were really after him in Ephesus and all oh, those yeah. cities. So I'm sure they did something heroic. To save him. Oh, yeah. You know, and then, and of course, they wound up being a big part of this church, which was fantastic, but they were a part of the team. You remember, the only reason he met them is because they were tent makers. So he probably led them to the Lord. They were just sitting around making tents, and he probably shared the good news with them. That's how they became a Christian. Yeah. But they were tent makers, just like he was. That's how he initially met them. So they, yeah. they were probably financially helping out the church, too, because he said... All the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them and greet also the church that meets at their house. So they were also leading a house church as well, which which you know speaks highly of who they are, which is pretty cool. Well then they greet another person, which I'm assuming how do you say his name? Uh, Eponetus. You know, he may have been the father of the sure. Eponets. Yeah, we had some friends. <laughs> So, so Epinetus, he was old the Paulus got a little confused about John the Baptist baptism and the baptism in Jesus, you know, and said that he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They like, uh oh, they invited him to their house and explained to him the way of God more adequately, which which biblically speaking. They kind of lined him, lined out, him on, out on exactly the difference of John's baptism. He didn't no, understand it. Where no Holy Spirit was given and the baptism. And that guy was an up and comer, too. It's oh, like yeah. He had a lot going on. A lot of disciples were following him. That's exactly right. Well, then you look again. But she was involved in the lining out. I'm, uh, you know, he didn't say, you know, Aquila is the one that did it. She was there, too. Oh, yeah. They were both were in front of him. So then verse 6. Here we go. Another woman, yep. single woman, I guess, Greek Mary, who worked hard for you. And then he, you know, the next two, he said that they were in prison with him. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ Jesus before I was. And you start reading through this and, and seeing um, how many times he mentions house churches and these households and like verse 11, greet those in the household and, and then how hard they're working like verse 12. And then like the yeah, second couple, part of I mean, they're, 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 they're in and out of jail. And I mean, look, he said, Trifina and Trifosa had to be twins, right? Those women who work over there. I mean, and then he brings up another woman, but Paul gets his reputation in the religious world. Like, Oh, he was against women. Cause he wrote the first Corinthians. Well, read Romans 16. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's more women being singled out here and addressed than there are men. Yeah, and and they're all meeting in homes. They're some of them have been in prison with them. They're being persecuted for them. They're out here in small groups and pods and in their homes, and they're trying to win the world. A lot of them, for too, Jesus. by the way, instead of being in uh, positions of uh, uh, of renowned positions. 
these people, they were just common, everyday right. people. Just normal folks. They're just normal folks. Yeah. A few of them had some... You know, these people weren't entitled they were with no. names and, you know, work your way up, you know, the, the ladder, you know, the spiritual ladder until you're finally a pastor and all that. He's saying these are very important people. There was one so, in here, though, who's uh, who was the head of the public works. I think he's a little bit later. Where was he at? One of them. Well, it was interesting you said that because I thought it was interesting that one of them was a guy who worked like in local government. Yeah. And he he made sure to mention him. He was like, you know, this yeah. guy's in charge of public works. Like, you know, he can help us out, you know, by doing so. But let's, let's take our last break, Jay. So I'm all for these mega churches, but what I want you to know is if you're having a mega church that's not a ritualistic meeting and you're on fire for Jesus, you're going to have this look within the community. Yep. And within what we call parish, you may call county. This is the model for great churches. Right. Different people working their tails off. Male and female. Male and female. Married couple, single girls, you know, yep. cousin in law, whatever. He's got them all addressed here who are out there working on a daily basis for Jesus. They have small groups of people. That's what the church is made up for, and that's how it should function. Miss Kay had one of her <clears throat> women that's with that group. When I came over here for us to do this, she's in the yard, and then one of the sisters came by and picked her up. They're headed. They had their Bibles with them. They're headed to do whatever women do when they in the Bible, like these girls yeah. here, <laughs> you know, whatever, they you know, it's not something that you, you would want to run up on as a man and say, Oh, Hey, how's it going here? I'll just join y'all. No, it's the women being women, you know, but they do a great work. They do. Well, they take the younger girls and they, they're, they're mentoring them. Al. Right. That's and what then they, I, I like it in 16. He, he gives them this, the culturally in the Eastern culture, and they still do it to this day. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The which, most unfulfilled verse in the entire that's Bible. That's exactly right. We if, we wanna that ma- if we want to make a, this, everything command-oriented, then we're going to have to start kissing each well, other. Well, as a borderline germaphobe, I've always <laughs> felt uncomfortable about that verse. But it, it became my friend when I started studying with legalists. who Like over what we said about this right. women's role, who are trying to turn their whole Christianity and what happens for one hour in a church building, what they call corporate setting. that That's what they want to argue about and discuss. And I'm like, well, you're not greeting one another with a holy kiss. They're like, well, that was a culture thing. <laughs> Greet one another with a holy kiss, period. Yeah, yeah that, that's what that, it says. If, if they're not going to take foot. That six foot distancing throws a wrench in those cogs. Yeah. Well, because right. you know, I was I was sitting there wondering, okay, now I've got to stay six feet away from me, but you want me to be to well, baptize well, you. In uh, our culture, it's a holy handshake or a holy side to side hug. That's what we would call. I do like well, that. I but, do like that he put the context in there that a holy kiss because a kiss can mean a lot of different things, a lot of different yeah. contexts. In this case, but look, I experienced it. I've told the story before when I went to Eastern Europe. And there was these all these new Christians. They were Albanians. On both sides. Of they the- kiss on both sides. And I mean, it at first I admit it, it, it. It's a little bit freakish, you know. You're not used to that. You get that stubble from a man on your cheek. It just doesn't yeah. feel right. Yeah. But over the three weeks I was there, uh, it's uncomfortable. I was, but look, that's just they come in. That's just how they greet you. So I wasn't. I'm in their culture. I wasn't going to say, "Hey, ho, 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 we don't do kissing around here." So I just went with it. And by the end of the three weeks, it felt natural. I it. think I would have just like when it, I came home though I I'd didn't start it at fist. WFR. I think I'd put the fist up as a blocker. <laughs> said, yeah, you'd have been the typical bump. of Mary. Let's 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 fist fight. Bump. Then no, it'd have been a boxing no match. Kissy, kissy. Well, <laughs> you may be able to grow in that area there. Okay? Uh yeah, maybe. So, <laughs> but my point was bringing up my niece when she got up. The same people that said, "Well, she can do this two hundred yards away, not on a Sunday morning." I think they're missing the point of my going through that was, is I think God did set up the system to help these decisions in providing elders and deacons. Yeah. And that those are the leaders of the church and they get together. And 
So it's not an authority issue. In First Corinthians 14, where were the elders? Yeah. Where were they at? Well, it was a young church. Young church. And that's part the, of the these problem. are the kind of the problems that you get into, and they have these miraculous Because you gifts. remember, everybody's new. It's yeah. not like it has some season. No, right. You know, we, but, and but, we come along 2000 years And a later. lot of tough backgrounds. Oh, exactly. Which well, well you, my point is people that are hollering about that verse saying, no, women, you know, it says here women should be silent. So, But they move that on to say, well, so then that hour and a half, they cannot. What does that mean? They cannot utter a word. So I'm saying I use this verse as an example. I'm like, well, you don't greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, then they said, well, that was a cultural thing. And I was like, well, why couldn't the other have some cultural and circumstance implications? Because when you read in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6, talking about us being ambassadors and we commend ourselves to every man's conscience and we set forth the truth plainly, nobody's thinking he's just talking about men there. I mean, not. women are ambassadors, just but so in that it's fine. So then they're like, yeah, but it's just in this ritualistic setting, they can't speak. You know, and there's some churches, unfortunately, out here where they can't open their mouth once they go into the. But look, I would always say, as a guy who preached a long time, be very wary of someone who has, who is presenting the word of God to you and takes one verse or one piece of a verse and mm-hmm. then builds a whole doctrine or theology or whatever off of that. that I'll tell you right there, you really need to look into that because if you're not understanding why it was said, when it was said, that is so you can take anything. We could take anything out of here and do anything we want with it if we're not going to be fair to the word of God. What I would also so say I would be very wary. I would that. be very wary of that. I would also be very wary when when you're trying to muzzle someone sharing Jesus yeah. in God's watch, grace. Watch that. Out for that. Back up, have a meeting. <laughs> what are we doing? That's right. What? Just think about that. Now, there's, yeah, if it was muzzling filth or four letter words or mm-hmm. pornography, or, okay. When you're trying to muzzle someone from sharing Jesus, wait a minute. Be leery. Have a meeting. Make sure <laughs> that. <laughs> Good night. It's a woman. She's speaking. You're like. Yeah. Which I think that's what led to verse 17, I, I which say. is what I was going to get. He yeah. said, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good. And here's That's I mean, a great, you're talking about statement. A great statement. Be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Yeah. His I, point I, was you browbeat women for no reason. You, well, you, or any issue. Or any issue. Oh, you, you can always find naive or young young Christians and manipulate them with scripture. I mean, you can, that's right. and, and that's what's happening in our culture, unfortunately, and in, in some churches. Yep. And this is why we're so splintered into so many groups. And look, it gets crazy out there with these fringe groups. I mean, there's people meeting in mountains today. that are actually a threat because since it's not based on Jesus and God's grace, a lot of times it leads into immorality and evil behavior and, and we've all seen that. Well, and, and he said, Dad, basically what you always say, I want to be wise about what is good. Pursue good. And when it comes to evil, don't want, don't don't even be innocent of that. Don't even want to know more. That's right. You know, back to the first thing. Just I don't even want to get into the more about evil. I want to I want to well, pursue that which you're is right. good. Which and I he like. made a key statement there about serving our Lord Jesus. I mean, Jesus is our Lord, and he gave us the model. He loved everybody equally. He tried, you know, to help people, and he was here about his father's business, and his attitude was always unselfish. I mean, that that's the model he was trying to get them to see. But then he closed it out. I want to read this because it's such a power-packed last paragraph. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you, this is 25, by my gospel and the 
proclamation of Jesus, which you remember when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16, but he says, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known to the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God. And here, I think, is the point of why he's writing, so that all nations might believe and obey him to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus. Amen. So we'll use that as our jumping off next time to uh, kind of wrap up the book of Romans. So see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.